Um, so thanks, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Callum Wilson. I'm uh, with uh, Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture, um, and obviously been involved with spud research for a while. Uh, so thanks for coming today. We're going to have two very exciting speakers um, who are still on their way. <laughs> um, their flight from uh, from Melbourne was uh, substantially delayed, and I believe they're about five ten minutes away. So. So my talk's being brought to the front, so you have to put up with me to start with. And uh, by the time I finish, they'll be walking the door ready to think of their presentations, I hope. Either that, or there's a bunch of students over here who, who are going to get some content into doing something as well. Um, but first, welcome everybody. Um, I was, Robert asked me to give a, just a, a really brief overview of some of the potato research, potato disease research we're doing here in TR and, and while I've summarised a few of the, the, the current projects, I then focused on, on, on I guess, one that's topical, which has got some, some sort of interesting uh, outcomes that, that, that might be exciting into the future. Um, this is all Okay, the, the humble potato. Um, so, most if not all of you are involved in the potato industry that we tend to think of as, well, <clears throat> the public in general uh, think of as, as, a, as a relatively staple, um, uninspiring, boring sort of thing compared to some of the other veggies. Um, <clears throat> I find that highly offensive. <laughs> I actually think potatoes are incredibly exciting. Um, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, and, and just some statistics for uh, for uh, global statistics for you in, in terms of how important potatoes are. They are the third most important, economically important food crop for humans globally, <coughs> after rice and wheat. Spuds is number three, um, so it beats <coughs> beats all the other. In terms of staples. Um, now, uh, and in fact over the last couple of years, the, the developing nations are the largest producers of potato and it is becoming an incredibly important food staple for a large number of people. In fact, the last estimate that was a few years back was over a billion people are receiving their, their, nutri their major nutrition from potato. That's, that's over 300 million tonnes per annum being produced. The other thing about spuds and why they're so exciting, and, and, and these, are, these are stats from the International Potato Centre, and why they are, apart from it's their job, but why they are so excited about potatoes in terms of feeding the world, is that potatoes are one of the most efficient conversions of sunlight to starch of all plants. Um, they, are, they produce two to four times as much um, food, as much nutrition as any of the cereals and use water up to seven times more efficiently. So when you're talking about trying to feed the world, um, <clears throat> really potatoes are, are a very important component of that <clears throat> versus our, our cereal grains that, that we currently focus on. So <clears throat> if you're part of the spud industry, it's, it's not quite so humble, I don't think. Um, Again, just wanted to introduce some of the, the projects we're currently doing in, in TIA around potato pathology and some of the people um, and some of them in the audience just now. Is this the one? No. Um, so we've, we've got a, a relatively... Um, one of our major focuses is on powdery scab and, 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 and Spogospora root infection. Um, and that's an ongoing program that we, we're currently... Uh, involved with. Uh, and here's some of the people. Um, so I kind of lead that. Robert, who will be arriving very shortly, is, is heavily involved. Annabelle, Mark, who's one of our previous PhD students and was a postdoc briefly, has, has also done an incredible amount of work in this area. Um, Jonathan, who's in the audience here, has just joined us and just starting his PhD uh, working in this area. Um, well, we've just, as of Friday, um, we, we heard we got a new, a new small grant to actually do some more work um, on powdery scab work from, from, the, from the government, which is great. 
that's going to give us a new PhD student um, and also strengthen our links with the chemistry department and at UTAS where we're looking at, at some of the chemistry associated with, with the disease and how we can use that to help manage it. Uh, we've also got, and I'm sure Liz Rayleigh, there she is, um, <coughs> you've pro possibly all been um, met or hassled by Rayleigh at some point to put sticky traps up. Um, we also run the, um, the surveillance program for tomato potato psyllid uh, in the eastern um, seaboard. Um, and that's, that's uh, continuing on until uh, about March next year uh, at this point. Um, Ray Lee is uh, really coordinating that and, I, and what I suggest, I'm not going to talk about this project at all, but what I'm suggesting is, is if anyone has any specific questions about psyllids and psyllid monitoring, capture her afterwards. Um, so Ray Lee's been great. Paul is, is um, the entomologist who primarily is, is the one who's primarily scanning all the traps and working out what we've got there, native psyllids and, and, uh, and hopefully no TPP. Um, we've got Steve and Jeff, another couple of entomologists involved, and Robert, once again, uh, in setting traps, particularly around the eastern uh, part of Tasmania. Again, a program funded by Hawk Innovation. Um, we've got, uh, again, this is a program that Robert's actually running, um, looking at, uh, uh, that's funded by the Tasmanian government, uh, looking at biofumigation, again, some of the science behind biofumigation as to what it, what it does and how it works uh, in terms of, um, of some potato pathogens. Um, and again, part of that, Robert running it, uh, we have soil scientists such as Richard Doyle, um, soil microbiologists such as Shane Powell, and, and the PhD student just about to commence in that area. Um, Sabine's in the audience, so we've got to introduce her too. Uh, again, a relatively small project, but this, uh, this is uh, another uh, ALC project funded uh, in collaboration with Woolworths and Zerola Fresh um, in South Australia, but looking at greening of potatoes. So from their perspective, primarily looking at, at fresh market potatoes um, and into the supermarkets where they're having concerns with obviously uh, greening and, and customer um, <coughs> rejection of, of green potatoes. So Sabine is a PhD student working in this area, looking at some of the genetics behind greening, looking at um, <coughs> some of the physiology of what makes things more likely to green and less likely to green, some of the genetics of greening, and also uh, eventually looking at some of the mitigation strategies, particularly around um, supermarket lighting and, and, and all that sort of aspect. We do have an ongoing, very, very low level at this stage project looking at um, genetics of potato resistance. So we've got some potato lines that you might remember. We had those common scab resistant potato lines and we've got other, um, <coughs> other lines that we're very interested in, in the genetics and the genomics of the resistance of those. Um, and so we've formed uh, uh, semi-formal linkages with um, some Kiwis. Um, Chris Winefield is actually a a viticulture guy at Lincoln Uni, but uh, a really smart switched on geneticist. And Gian Jacobs, who was one of the team that actually sequenced the potato uh, genome the first time. Uh, and so these guys are working with us to look at um, some of the, uh, the, the genetics behind the resistance. We've actually sequenced our, our, our resistant potato. We've now got a ridiculous amount of information um, that we have to work out what it all means. Um, but that's, that's an ongoing thing that I hope to spend a bit of time next year in New Zealand to, um, to finalise so we can actually look at, at what we've done there um, and, and, and how we can use that resistance to, uh, to expand it into other varieties. Um, and the last one I wanted to highlight um, is, is again a very small project that, um, that Les knows all about because he was the one who instigated it. Um, but it's something that Maria, uh, who works with Tia, is, is, was driving. Um, Maria, actually she's back now, um, she, um, she shot off to Brazil, um, and, uh, and I think she's just returned back to Australia now. But um, this was to look at a tool that might help allow um, selection, appropriate selection of, of fields for potato production. So it might be from a field office perspective, looking at 
who's best to contract, which growers are best to contract, which ones have the best land, um, soil suitability, water availability, frost free, um, all of those parameters. Um, or it might be from a grower, um, I need to lease some, some new land, where's the best land that I can lease and how do I find that? Is it the person I know from down the road or do I actually, <coughs> can we actually use a tool to help identify um, those linkages and actually find networks of people who have available land <coughs> and land users? Um, so that's, that's just a small project and Bettina um, from Simplot is also involved in that and, and Tony Butler from TIA. Um, on that perspective, anyone who actually uh, was willing to have a, have a brief chat afterwards about um, how you perceive um, you would select uh, fields for, uh, um, for growing potatoes, um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have a, have a brief chat about that afterwards. But, <coughs> while these guys are still arriving, all I want to do is briefly talk about one one um, aspect of our powdery scad work. Um, more than happy to talk about any of the other ones if you wish, but um, powdery scad is a, a topical topic. And, and this, we've got some interesting outcomes that we think are going to be very interesting into the future in terms of novel tools for management. So powdery scab, as we know it, this is the tumor disease, powdery scab. Um, it's fairly ugly. Um, it obviously has a <laughs> it's obviously a cosmetic um, issue for fresh market. Um, usually processing, you probably peel most of that off. Um, so so <clears throat> less of a, a cosmetic issue for the processing sector. <clears throat> but what becomes more and critical, and really over the last 10 years or so, um, people have realised that, uh, that some of the other things that are happening below the ground are actually much more significant. So we always knew they formed root galls. Um, and people kind of ignored that. We also know that inside the roots themselves, these, these fungal structures uh, form in the roots themselves. They don't rot the roots, they don't kill the roots, they don't kill the plants, and they tend to be ignored. Um, but actually, one of the guests that will be arriving, Richard Falloon, who's, who's somewhat of a guru on powdery scab, um, some time ago he, he showed um, that the yield impact on root infection is quite substantial. And, and subsequently, locally here, again, um, <coughs> the, the, the evidence um, from, from local observations is that, is that powdery scab was, was likely to be causing quite major yield impact on, on production from the root infection. <coughs> um, uh, Anne Ramsey um, did, a, did a summary uh, of potential costs of some of the major diseases, doing, doing surveys and, and adding up cost of losses, cost of seed rejection, cost of, of uh, fungicide treatments and otherwise. And for powdery scab, uh, the estimate back then, that was um, 26, no, 2014, was something in the order of about $13 million per annum for the processing, Australian processing sector only, <coughs> um, which is fairly, Substantial, and that might well underestimate the actual actual losses. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is one of the reasons. And again, experimentally, you can show this quite quite easily. Um, here's a nice healthy plant. Here's one that's been dipped in some uh, pathogen, uh, and you can see the difference in the, in the root mass in the plant vigor, and and. And even, you're also getting some secondary rots in there too, which is not, not helping things a lot. So it, it really is a much more substantial pathogen than a lot of people globally were willing to admit. Why are some of the reasons I, that, that we have a particularly high, um, a big problem here? Um, we do, ever since uh, we've, we've now have the predictor PT um, tests that can actually work out how much pathogens in your soil, um, and, and there's been substantial testing done around, uh, obviously around Australia, uh, but also internationally. Um, for what reason or not, um, Tasmanian soils seem to be <coughs> the world's best at ho harbouring this pathogen. We have some of the highest levels of, of the powdery scab pathogen in our soils here than anywhere else globally, um, <coughs> which is not the thing we really want to be the winners of, but unfortunately that's what we've got. We've got great soils for growing potatoes, We've got great soils for growing powdery scab too, unfortunately. Um, 
We also um, have, I mean, a variety like Russell Burbank, for example, is a major variety. It, it has relatively weak root <coughs> system compared to some other potato varieties. Um, we've got great conditions for, for the disease, plenty um, soil moisture. You add all this together, we've got a bit of a perfect storm. We've got lots and lots of pathogen. We've got a variety that's nice and susceptible to root infection. Oh good, they've arrived. Um, and we've got a root system that's relatively weak. If we then take off 20% of the root function, we're going to get significant yield impacts. And that's what we believe is happening. Right, busy slide, um, but this is just to kind of give a little bit of the biology of what we're dealing with here and, and, how we, and, and how we have to try and manage this. So the pathogen itself um, lives in the soil of these little, uh, these things up here. They're called sporosauro, but they're actually agglomerations of these resting spores. And those things can survive in the soil for at least 10 years, 20 years perhaps. They will sit there and wait. They're very tough. You can dry the soil, they'll still survive. You can, you can bake the soil, they'll survive. They're very, very tough, and they'll outlast a rotation. <clears throat> so rotation is important, but not the control for this disease. The, 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 the soil inoculum will slowly decline, but it will never disappear over a standard rotation. They wake up, and they release these zoospores that look like this. <clears throat> these zoospores are a bit different. They only live for a maximum of five hours once they're released. And they're highly sensitive to environmental conditions. But once they're released, they quickly swim through the soil moisture, find a potato root, bind to it like this, inject all their good goodies into that potato root, infect the <coughs> potato, and you start an infection. That potato then forms lots more zoospores, and you get reinfection, 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 and next thing, the whole, the whole root mass is, is infected. And that occurs very rapidly once infection first starts. Um, so <clears throat> this disease, once it progresses, can go really quickly and you can end up with, with this major impact. <coughs> so what have we been doing trying to look at it? Um, well, there's a whole bunch of, bunch of aspects we're looking at. We're trying to understand the ecology of this thing, how it actually survives and grows and, 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 and uh, wakes up in, in the soil system, how it actually moves and infects the potato. <coughs> One thing which I'm going to really talk about here is, is our work with looking at root exudates and how they're involved in waking these spores up and causing that infection in the first place. Um, we've shown that that attachment to the root is absolutely critical for infection and that resistant varieties, that attachment process is much less efficient than susceptible varieties. So, so if you've got a super susceptible variety, they bind on really easily and you get lots of infection. If you've got a resistant variety, you only get one or two, you still get infection, but it's, that's, that's where the resistance seems to be happening, and then we're keen to explore that a bit more as well. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit from that on some new tools that we hope to develop for an upgrade <coughs> management. Uh, and, and we've also got another, another option we're trying to look at in terms of not only controlling disease, but trying to make the plants tougher, make the roots a bit bigger, make, them, make the plants actually tolerate the infection even more. So try and kill the pathogen, but also make the plants grow bigger. And that's, that's our multi-pronged approach that we're going to move forward with. So we're trying to look at where is the Achilles heel? Um, where can we actually um, <clears throat> find the weakness in this particular pathogen? So this guy, he's actually working with the sister pathogen. So this is, um, he was talking about um, club root, which is very, very similar to powdery scab pathogen but essentially saying the period from when this guy wakes up to infection is that period of weakness because this survives, it's very tough, survives for years. Once infection's occurred, it's too late. This guy here, once it's swimming around in the soil system, as I said, is very labile, survives for a maximum of five hours and then dies. What can we do between there and there to stop infection? First off, why do they survive for so long? They are dormant. So these, these resting spores will sit in the soil and they'll wait and they'll wait and they'll wait. But they are very clever. They respond to cues that there's a host plant around. So it's a waste of time because they only live for, the zoospores only survive for five hours. They don't want to release them 
similar around to find there's nothing to infect. So they wait until they get a signal. They wait until they see a, uh, <coughs> compounds released from the roots of plants, from potato plants. They'll actually signal them and tell them, hey, there's a potato here. You better wake up and start infecting me. <coughs> and these com components, these chemicals that are released from potato roots, um, will stimulate that germination of those dressing spores, stimulate the release of these zoo spores that then cause the infection. Um, and we've done a whole bunch of work with some smart chemists um, and looking at the range of chemicals that are exuded by potatoes and then examine each one of those individually and finding out which ones actually are responsible for stimulating zoo spore release. And here's a bunch of some of the chemicals that are all released in potato roots. There's a whole swag of them. These are amino acids and organic acids and sugars and you name it. Um, but there's a group of them here that actually seem to be quite important for stimulating waking up of zoo spores. <clears throat> so things like tyramine, glutamine, uh, raminose, a whole bunch of, of chemicals. <clears throat> there are a wide range of chemicals and they're not potato specific which is interesting. You know, some of these same things, glutamine is produced by wheat as well, um, and wheat exudates. So, so it's not just a potato thing, but, but they are important at waking up the pathogen. Not only do these wake up the pathogen, telling the pathogen, hey, wake up, there's a potato around, they also provide a signpost to tell them where to go. Um, so these same compounds act as chemical attractants. So, so it's like a gradient. You've got a potato producing the chemical and, and the zoospore is sitting here and it can sniff out the chemical and it can go, oh, I'll swim towards where the concentration is greatest, which means I'm, I aim towards the root. So instead of randomly swimming around and hitting a root, they are directed directly to a potato root. They'll bind to that root, they'll start infection. Again, a very, very clever system <clears throat> that makes sense. So it sits there, waits for a chemical signal, wakes up, uses that same chemical signal to hone in on a root to start the infection process. This image here is, is actually a, uh, a, um, <clears throat> an absorbent particle that we loaded full of root exudate material and then we put it in a, in a solution and allowed uh, all these zoo spores and they all started swimming towards it. So those arrows are some of the zoo spores that are swimming towards that, that, that compound. So what does it all mean? And, 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 and that's sort of nice to know, but what can we use this? How can we actually use it? Um, we know the pathogen will wait until the soil until resting spores are chemically stimulated. So they'll wait until something tells them to wake up. They'll then be attracted to the roots, and then root infection occurs really rapidly, and, and, and you'll get continual reinfection. So it's very efficient. <clears throat> How can we use it? Well, the first approach we've looked at, and we've done a little bit of work in here, which actually suggests this might even work, which is really great. As I said before, we've got some of the highest levels of this pathogen in our soil at the moment. <clears throat> and, and over a rotation, those numbers will slowly decline, but they'll never disappear. Can we accelerate that loss? Can we actually help to manage that, that amount of pathogen in the soil by using what we know now? <clears throat> um, so what we're saying is, if we stimulate germination, you chemically stimulate it, but there's no potato root. So we know the chemicals that stimulate it now. If we can put those into the soil system, when there's no potatoes around. And they wake up, and they swim around for five hours, and they go, oops, and then they die. Germinate to exterminate. So that's, 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 that's the aim. <clears throat> can we actually help reduce that soil inoculum by tricking them into waking up at the wrong time? We did a little brief pot experiment just to try and prove that might even work. So we got soil, we pre-tested the amount of spongosper in there, we added the stimulant, uh, we then sampled it after a month or so, um, and then to see how much was left. And at least proof of concept, it seems to be sort of working. Um, so here's the blue is pre, the yellow is post, that's just with water when we're adding. When we add the stimulant or a mix of stimulants, we have significantly crashed the amount of pathogen in those pots. Okay, this is the pot. Everything works in the pot. We've now got to take this 
for a field system. We've got to work out how we can actually do that at a, at a commercial scale. But some of the materials we're talking about are pretty cheap. Um, what we need to do now is work out how we can actually get material there, get it through the soil profile, and actually see what that might do. We also suspect that this is not going to be done in one month. We suspect this is going to have to be something that you commence immediately post-harvest your potatoes, when the arcing levels are super high. Then we start looking at soil treatment before the next rotation and before the next potato um, <coughs> crop goes in. So we've got four, five, seven years for these materials to actually do their job and try and eliminate or reduce pathogen levels to layers much, much lower than what normal rotation would already do. So that's something we hope to uh, we now, now start to do some work at a field level and see whether we can actually get some traction. The other thing which we haven't started yet but I find kind of <coughs> fascinating to think about is can we also confuse these guys? A bit like, I don't know, have anyone seen that in fruit trees where, where you're trying to stop cogging moths attacking your fruit and they put these lures around everywhere and, they, and, the, and, the, and the males go and, and fly off and get stuck in a lure instead of finding the females. They've got these pheromone traps and they actually create this, this chemical signals throughout the orchard and, and, and disorientate the males and they find traps instead of females to breed with. What if we did something similar in the soil? What if we included a whole bunch of granules or something with these, with these chemical stimulants <coughs> and these attractants? And these loose spores, once they are released, and there are potatoes around, but instead of swimming towards the roots, they swim toward these granules and go, what's this? This isn't any good. <coughs> and they still fail to infect. Or, now we know these compounds, can we use or manipulate the, the bugs in the rhizosphere to eat those chemicals and stop them being active? Um, a whole bunch of things we could possibly do to try and change the chemistry around the soil root so that uh, we might reduce some of that infection. The other thing which uh, we've got some very preliminary data on but we do need to check uh, and test it at a much better level is seeing can we actually make some of our current controls better. We know fluazinam is a uh, fungicide that's currently registered for um, for powdery scab control. But we also know, and we've, we've shown it in our lab too, that it only kills zoo spores. It does not touch the resting spores. So you put it into a soil system, and it'll, it'll, when there's potatoes around, anything that wakes up and starts swimming towards the potatoes, yeah, it gets killed. <coughs> but the, zoo spore, uh, the, the resting spores that don't wake up happily sit there and wait out the chemist, chemical until it loses efficacy. And then any zoo spores that's subsequently released will happily uh, move towards the potato and start causing infection. So what we want to think now is <clears throat> can we actually make this chemis chemical more efficient by mixing it or, or, or pre-treating it or, or somehow with these stimulants so we wake up much more of the resting spores, we release a lot more zoo spores and then kill the whole lot rather than a little bit at a time. <clears throat> so again, that's, that's something we hope to have a look at in the very near future beyond uh, the lab. <coughs> and we have our special guests here, so I'll stop there and ask uh, and invite any questions. i just make a comment. I reckon that's the uh, best explanation I've heard about the uh, about how the uh, how the scabber went into the world. So all done, Cal. I reckon that's great. Thank you. If anyone just wants to hear more about potato greenies or uh, <laughs> salads or <laughs> you guys are in the audience. I've got a question, Cal. Yep. Um, did the pool as an air or something in action before? Um, and it seemed to protect the tubers from powder scab, but it didn't seem there was still plenty of root gall. Yep. What, what, how would that work? With uh, what, what it's a lot they've done is delay the start of infection, and that can be significant. So, so again, we've got, we've got work to show that if you delay the start of infection, um, I'll do this. So here we go, here is time. Um, if the way, way this infection occurs is you've got really low levels and then, and then infection starts and then it takes off like that, absolutely takes off. Um, and, uh, and this is the amount of root infection. So. If you add fluazinam 
because um, it's, it's killing off some of those loose balls and while it's still lasting, it kind of delays it a bit and then you start getting build up later. Um, what you tend to find is you need a certain amount of time of root infection, and this root infection is occurring like this, and then eventually it will get through to tuber infection. Tuber infection, excuse me. So if you delay that, you will reduce tuber infection, um, which is why flazenam is great if you're trying to stop tuber infection. Um, it can also reduce the damage to your roots. Um, that delay is still really significant. I mean, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. That will actually reduce the damage and reduce the yield loss from that, that root damage as well. Because the plants then are bigger. <clears throat> you know, if, you, if you infect the little plants, only got a tiny amount of roots, that damage is much greater than if you've got a bigger plant with a lot more roots and it's already got a lot of growth behind it. <clears throat> um, you'll still get root galls, um, but maybe, uh, maybe you'll protect from, from a fair amount of, of, um, of uh, <clears throat> tuber damage. So, so yeah, it's still, still a great chemical. Expensive chemical, but it's still a great chemical. Um, but, uh, but that's why you're still getting that. Yeah, so the roots are very easy to infect, and they can, they can infect them from when they're tiny, and then and any mature plants will still be infected. Yeah. Yep. Do you think the bottom tier potatoes have a uh, role to play, that we have to get rid of them? Absolutely, I think they have a massive role to play. Um, and again, something we have to do over the, um, in one of the uh, paddocks up the hill there is, is look at, 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 at a small scale of rigorous roguing versus less rigorous roguing, <laughs> where you've got one or two or three or four <coughs> volunteer potato. I think you're absolutely right that, that, um, that the amount of inoculum that a single plant can produce is massive, um, and, and that will help maintain and build it across. And, and I, think, I think those that actually have the most hygienic <coughs> Practices in terms of removing their volunteers probably have the best, um, the, the lowest soil inoculum levels. How about nightshade? Been... Nightshade is is a host, um, and that can also be a problem. Um, we've also recently shown uh, mentioned a lot, um, things like poppies actually are hosts. Um, Pyrethrum is a host. They're not as good hosts. Potatoes are tremendous hosts. Those guys are weak hosts. But uh, but I know there's even some some data from Soil testing immediately post poppies, and there's this massive spike in Spongospora. That may have been because there might have been a bit of poppy root in that test as well, perhaps. And, and, and <clears throat> because they don't appear to produce galls, so they shouldn't be producing those resting spores. But it is a host. Um, it might be more of an issue for the poppy industry, actually, whether it's actually causing root damage and, and yield loss for them, too. But So, other crops, yes, are hosts, but nightshade. Bad one, volunteer potatoes even worse. So, so Callum, if you if you exhaust the zoo spores and the resting spore, does the resting spore die out or does it actually regenerate again itself? No, does it actually a, yeah. kill kill off the resting spores? Yeah. yeah. Each each resting spore, so each one of these things. Each one of these is, is an agglomeration of hundreds or thousands of individual spores. So each one of these resting spores is just like a protective coat, like a bubble. Inside each one is one zoo spore. Once it's released, that's just an empty shell. So if you release a whole lot, um, they're all gone. Now, now Jonathan's actually got, got a neat idea where he's gonna actually try and dissect and, and slice through these sporosauri and, and after treatment and work out which ones actually are released. Is it just the ones around the outside? <coughs> or is it, is it more random? Um, we're trying to work out which ones are chemically stimulated? Um, why aren't some, you know, why are some constitutively dormant and not released straight away? I mean, it makes sense for the pathogen. You don't want to just release them all at once because then you're all dead. Um, you want to slowly release them. Um, <clears throat> so we want to obviously make that more efficient and release as many as we can. Um, but once it's, once it's gone, it's gone. Okay. Well, thank you.